As Decker doing creepy. You will not be removing my pants without showing me a pair of hers. Chihuahuas are eating my toes. You might not run from the Christmas kiss up! She's like the world! Well, he stopped trying to run outside without any clothes on. I think I know what to do. <laughs> oh, how? Huh? What? Where? When? Who? Sometimes why? You tried going through the space warp. It was overclocking too much to send you home, and your brain got a little scrambled. You should be fine, though. Provided there are no lingering side effects, of course. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, wait, side effects? Mm, occasionally, extra-dimensional beings will try to exploit rifts in the space-time void to their advantage, usually by coming through them or possessing people. Does this mean I'm possessed? Mm, you show no obvious signs of being under the influence of anything, other than your usual scatterbrainness, that is. So it looks like you're good. Now we can get back to watching the two of you not make out with each other. Yes, you must sacrifice ox in the burner altars. Sorry, you say something, Decker? Um, must be still dizzy from that whole space warp thing. It, wait, wait a minute, Jimmy Thulu. I dreamt that I was making out with Creepy. How did you find out about that? I'll plead the fifth. Wait, you dreamt that we were making out? No, no, I, I didn't say, I didn't do anything. Look, it looks like I'm not going to be going home anytime soon, so let's just preview the next kaiju film on the list or whatever, okay? Sure, okay, we'll get to that. And now we move on to plan B. <laughs> uh, hello, World Wide Web. I'm. Decker Shadow. Decker Shadow! The internet personality with... stuff. And I'm that long-haired creepy guy. And today, we're going to take a look at... Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, giant monsters will attack. What he said. After being stuck with kids' movies all this time, it's good to come back to a millennium-era Godzilla flick. The other films we covered with Godzilla in them were not from the millennium era. It's a figure of speech. No, it's not. Shut up! At any rate, this film is replete with the destruction of buildings and the annihilation of human life at the hands, wings, and claws of colossal monsters. A perfect movie for date night, or feasting around the bulge of your enemies. What? Oddly enough, the film was not originally intended to have the cast that it ended up featuring. Giant Monsters All Out Attack did star Godzilla, but King Ghidorah and Mothra replaced Anguirus and Varan. The result is... Interesting, to say the least. This is perhaps the only kaiju film thus far that features King Ghidorah as a force for good. Well, there goes half my interest already. So you're saying you prefer Ghidorah when he's more like this? I'd almost make myself forget about that. Anyway, let's take a look at Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, giant monsters, all out attack. Fuck, that's a long title. And see if this film can finally wash the taste of kids' movie out of my throat. The film opens with a military history lesson, which covers the universe this takes place in quite well. Evidently, in this movie, the original Godzilla from 1954 was an actual historical event, though few other instances involving kaiju occurred. All the New York attack was Godzilla, right? by the defense forces. We now That's what all the American the experts claim. But our guys here have doubts. <laughs> I have never heard the 1998 World of film described quite so succinctly. <laughs> you know what's real great? In Japan, when that line played in theaters, audiences laughed and cheered. <laughs> <laughs> we cut to a report saying that an American nuclear submarine has gone missing. The sub is quickly found, causing speculation that it exploded. Right. Explosions cause claw marks on the side of subs. Teeth marks too, by the looks of it. This leads to our first glimpse of Godzilla. Though the giant king of all kaiju is revealed quite early in the film, we don't get an especially good look at him. Given how famous he is, Godzilla ought to start carrying around 8x10 glasses. He probably assumes that anyone spotting a giant radioactive dinosaur stomping near Japan is going to automatically know it's him. Um, cases of mistaken identity like that have happened before in kaiju films. Uh, never mind the real and immediate threat, we cut to Mount Miyoko where we meet Yuri Tachibana, played by Chiharu Niyama. Yuri is filming a docudrama for her low-rent, third-rate tabloid television network.
What was that? The monster? So, she reports for the Japanese equivalent of the History Channel. You're never going to forgive them for that ancient alien series, are you? It was fun. I'd forgotten all about that family reunion. Uncle Neolato Tep went a little nuts with the punch. That night, a biker gang materializes to harass a local elder and his girlfriend and decapitate a small statue before moving on to terrorize a truck driver. It's not Godzilla. It's not Mothra. And it's not King Ghidorah. Who the fuck's that? Pace the ring, though. Shining light to every falls. Shines for Radice to make the world a better place. Baruganamu. What? No, no, no. Baragon isn't in this movie. This is, uh. Baragon. Completely different character. Right now, service dog. Yudi hears about the biker gang getting buried alive and wants to report on it, but her third rate broadcasting company, head by Japanese John Romero, isn't interested. The company is called BS. Literally, BS. She really should have seen this coming. BS also stands for Broadcast Standards in the Network Industry. Of course, that just makes this whole thing ironic. We go back to the scene where the biker gang is still helplessly trapped. Not to fear, though. The military has arrived with their latest weapon, the Drill Missile. Who the fuck's been working in R&D, Dr. Wiley? No. The SWAT Cats. We got it, Creepy. We know how much you miss SWAT Cats. It's okay. We go back to Yuri again, where she is having a fucking awesome dinner, but can't enjoy the delectably delicious-looking delicacies, because... Sometimes I wish I'd been born a man. Huh? <laughs> Why's that? Because I'm not allowed to make the programs I want to make. And this has to do with your gender... how? I know feminism is a few years behind compared to the United States, but Becker's right. You work for a crappy TV network. Having boobs probably increases your chances of being listened to. Yuri's magic Japanese boob powers allow her to come into possession of a book that outlines all of the major plot points for her. She celebrates by getting completely wasted. <laughs> I got it! They break out into Kyra, okay, and it summons Mothra. No. Her father, Admiral Taizo Tachibana, played by Yuro Uzaki, appears at the door to frighten away Yuri's partner, Teruaki Takeda, played by Masahiro Kobayashi, who helped Yuri get home. Never mind that for the moment, though. It's time to meet our new group of kaiju victims. <laughs> I think Decker needs to have his throat looked at. It sounds like he's coming down with something. A group of expendable characters spend their last few minutes alive robbing a convenience store, vandalizing sacred ground, and attempting to murder a helpless dog. We're not going to miss these people, are we? And the body count rises. <laughs> What's the matter? Can you? <laughs> Wait, she saved the doggy though, right? Come on, it's Mothra. Kuba's right. She'll save the dog and murder the teenagers. Huh. Somehow I like her better now. The next day, Yuri and her team pay a visit to Hirotoshi Isayama, played by Hideo Amamoto. The mysterious old man provides Yuri with cryptic warnings of Godzilla's return. Once the team is done ignoring this, they make tracks to Mount Fuji to investigate a shrine talked about in the big book of spoilers that Yuri was given. Hey look. It's gone. And the big mystery is the sticks disappeared. That's really underwhelming. No kidding. Mystery Incorporated can rest easy knowing this bunch is on the case. After discovering the mystery of the missing shrine sticks, Yuri hears that Godzilla is possessed by the spirits of dead soldiers who perished during World War II. The big book of spoilers corroborates this with a chapter on how the Guardian Beasts are also filled with the souls of... other people. Yeah, this was a change that really upset a lot of people. The director, Shusuke Kaneko, wanted the movie to have a more spiritual bend to it. Originally, the Souls of the Dead angle was supposed to replace the radioactive element entirely, but fear of public backlash made the director instead combine the ideas. Let's take a break from all this meaningful exposition to watch a businessman attempting to hang himself. That sounds like... wait a minute. Is that Inspector Osako? 
Life after the Gamera trilogy was not kind to the man, evidently. No kidding. You'd think that he'd try to work his way into one of the Mothra movies. And then he'd really want to kill himself, Greedy. Inspector Osako does not, in fact, hang himself with his own tie. Instead, he gets a free pass to ride the happy slide of Mount Fuji. This drops him right smack dab into King Ghidorah's lair. Because that's a huge improvement. Die at the hands of a three-headed dragon, or the threads of a really tacky tie? You be the judge. I have to take the dragon myself. There's little chance of King Ghidorah breaking free, though, so long as the Prophet Ghost Man is still somehow locked away in prison. Therefore... to people getting put back in jail. Digatana, digatana. This was gonna dig another tana. Now that the ghost is free from prison, again, somehow, we go down to the docks so that Godzilla can make his grand appearance for the urban population. <laughs> this seems oddly familiar somehow. I like how only that one guy notices the enormous wave approaching the docks. Godzilla's first urban rampage is rife with what you'd expect. Buildings being crushed, nuclear explosions from radiation breath, and of course, a badass soundtrack. Baragon senses Godzilla's presence and makes his way across the countryside so the two can have their big smackdown complete with WWE commentary. Folks! We have a real grandstand view of this rumble here! Oh, and Godzilla puts the food in again! Ah! There! You see? B-A-R-A, -A, not B-A-R-U. Rhinoceros dog. <laughs> you pay my thing you very soon. I'm beginning to sense a change in Decker's behavior. I think he has the flu. Yuri arrives to get the big scoop and gets a front row seat to Godzilla annihilating Baragon before he can use his rainbow attack. DIFFERENT MONSTER! Rhinoceros dog. Yeah! A very mild bump on the head puts Yuri in the hospital briefly, surrounded by far more critically injured people. While there, she takes the time to try and comfort a small child. By lying to said child. Everything's gonna be fine. Because, hey, it's not like you'll be held accountable later. Because the child will most likely be dead. Yuri's partner does not want her to drive because he is of the mindset that she shouldn't be driving toward giant radioactive creatures. Yuri seems to think this again has something to do with her lack of a penis. Again, that has nothing to do with it. It's just that you had a really stupid idea. She buys a bike to get around with while the people who have common sense evacuate the area. Meanwhile, the military finally decides to spring into action. Much to my own shock, they actually manage to hit Godzilla, though it still doesn't have any effect. Awesome. Isn't Mothra supposed to be in this movie? She saved the puppy. Now we get to see Godzilla kill everyone! As it happens, Mothra spun a peanut-shaped cocoon around herself while Godzilla rampaged and is ready to emerge. Fuck! And you know what this means, Decker. What? Hey, look! What's that? What happened to this song? They're supposed to be singing during this! Oh, thank fuck. I don't think I could stand another Mothra Macarena number. Actually, there is a way for me to fix this. Are you done now? Yes, I'm quite satisfied. Thank you. Before we go any further, though... Okay, I'm cutting you both off as of right now. We are never using that song again. Do you hear me? Keep telling yourself that. <laughs> We go through some military posturing for a bit before arriving at Yokohama so that Godzilla and Mothra can square off against one another. Yes! Finally! Oh, great. Another chance for that damn moth to somehow kick Godzilla's ass with the power of friendship. Oh! Oh, look out! What is this oh, oh. Ah! Jesus, my buddies were in there! Did Mothra just get a bunch of men killed? She probably just didn't have time to run over. She's had how many movies now to learn how to fly? King Ghidorah arrives at the battle to lend Mothra a hand. Is that right? 
Apparently, Ghidorah is one of the good guys in this movie, which sounds so weird I can't believe I'm saying it. Anyway, he puts up an admirable fight, but is no match for Godzilla, who prepares to finish off the... You okay, sir? No! 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 And just in case it wasn't clear, no! No! Right, so, uh, not okay. Got it. The military tries their drill bit missiles on Godzilla, but they cannot penetrate his hide. Godzilla retaliates by wiping out every single fucking military unit within a five mile radius, except the boat with the important characters on it. So he charges up one last attack. But Mothra is here to... Okay. What I miss? Um, uh, Mothra just got blown to bits. What? No! 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 It's okay though. Mothra uses her dusty spirit form to re-energize King Ghidorah. Remorse for the military personnel she got killed? Fuck them! They're supposed to die anyway! Decker, Kaiju movie. Look it up. Ghidorah takes the fight with Godzilla underwater and manages to wound him, but despite a long and pretty kick-ass combat, Ghidorah eventually gets taken out just the same. The military decides to step in and save the day by having a submarine fire a missile into an open wound of Godzilla's. What happens instead is... Which is funny because it's not like the launch systems were malfunctioning or anything. Stupid fucking sub, stupid fucking three headed dragon, stupid fucking movie! Uh, the missile actually leaves Godzilla's body, injuring him, but not outright killing him. Yuri and her partner are watching the whole scene unfold nearby. Because reporters have a death wish in kaiju films. How is that even possible? The, 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 the generator goes through the bloodstream and it, it's very complicated. The film ends with Godzilla blowing himself to pieces. Yuri's father survives and the two are reunited, though there's the question of whether or not he's absorbed radiation. Still, happy ending, I suppose. But wait, Godzilla's heart still beats. Which means it all sprout legs and a tail and terrorize Japan again someday? And you complain about inconsistencies with the moth. Well, that was Godzilla, Mothra, and King or Giant. Fuck it. That was the movie, and. It's delicious! Watching the vile moth get her best desserts. <coughs> I mean, the movie was a great example of the kaiju genre with fantastic creatures and situations, plus human characters that are important, or at least ones you care about. The military, for instance, is not entirely faceless as there are several recurring players who have distinct relationships with other humans we follow around via kaiju tradition, such as the journalist. The human characters actually do hold up some of the story, which is excellent as they are so often proven to be the weak link in this particular genre. The kaiju battles are both epic and play out well with the plot. The downside, however, is in how the kaiju are portrayed. Godzilla is definitely the antagonist, which works as he has often flip-flopped back and forth between Japan's downfall and savior against bigger threats. Turning King Ghidorah good, however, feels awkward when he has so often been portrayed in the past as the most vile kaiju of them all. And of course, there's that other matter in the movie that we won't even bring up right now. You're still not over that? I'm not as big a Mothra fanboy as certain others, but I have to say the way she was handled in this movie didn't feel quite right. You can tell this plot was made for a different cast of monsters, as the two added later for marketability didn't behave like themselves, even if their actions fit with whatever this movie professes the Guardian monsters to be all about. Weirder still is the decision to take away Mothra's trademark attacks and give her new ones that honestly didn't seem to fit her all that well. Even with this film's glaring problems, it still has a lot to offer overall. 
The characters are well portrayed and stay consistently interesting for the most part. The plot feels well paced and doesn't drag on unnecessarily. Aside from Mothra's death, the film is a solid five star. The out of character moments take away a lot, but I have to say that if Mothra had to die in this movie, at least she went out standing for what she believed in. The continuing cycle of life and the support of others over herself. Thus, Giant Monsters All Out Attack scores four murdered dog killers out of five. Overall, Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters All Out Attack, delivers an explosively awesome series of battles with a decent enough excuse to have them. Unfortunately, the fact that several monsters didn't act like themselves means that it feels less like a movie about Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, and more about Godzilla plus generic heroes. Therefore, Godzilla, Mothra, and... Oh, fuck it. The movie comes in at four SWAT cat drill bit missiles out of five. Thank you all for watching. I have been Decker Shadow. And remember... Hey, Decker, look over there. What? Uh, I, uh, why am I duct taped to the floor? And why does this keep happening to me whenever I'm at your place? Slight problem. Seems you were possessed after all. Not to worry, though. We have a simple solution. It involves the two of you kissing. Not now, Chibi Thulu. Mm. Uh, no! Do you hear me? Absolutely not! Not to worry, Decker. I anticipated such a reaction from you. As it happens, there is another way to exercise the malevolence. And I suppose this method is some painful, terrible torture method designed to stretch my sanity until it snaps like a twig. Am I right? Actually, yes. The two of you could just kiss. Uh, yeah, I'll take the torture method, thanks. Works for me. I suspected as much. No evil in the cosmos, no matter how terrible, could possibly sit through more than a few seconds of that show. So, it worked? I'm cured? All signs nominal. You two should probably make out for a bit anyway, though. Just to be safe. Enough, Chibi Thulu. Yes, you're fine now. Oh, good. How about letting me up off the floor? <sighs> Thanks. Listen, I know I haven't exactly been nice to you over these last few weeks, uh, and Decker. And it's, uh, um, it's really nice that you let me stay here while the space warp charges. Uh, and uh, Decker. I just wanted to say how much that meant to me, even though I know you, know, you did kidnap me before, but then again, I did send that alien after you, the predator. Decker! I also cast that spell last October that really messed our shows up. Plus, I mean, it's not like I haven't kidnapped people before. Decker! What? You're not wearing pants. <laughs> It was in that cave underground! I tell you, it had a horrible head on it! It's gonna come and get us! Well, if you're sure about it, why don't you put it on your website? I... Uh, yeah, sure. Wait, I forgot my line.